Hey everybody, this is Adams, and this is where I look at some of my favorite pots in Edmund DeWald's The Pot Book and try to figure out how they were made. And today we will be looking at um, some Italian Deruda ceramics. And Deruda, this is on page 79, and Deruda is, refers to not the maker, but a hillside town, hilltop town in central Italy and this pot was made in the 16th century. Um, what's notable about it is that it's a really classic form in that they developed this form or kind of uh, borrowed this form and really went with it. There's a lot of different variations of this that we'll be seeing a little later on uh, that has this kind of fat belly, this thick neck, this little kind of vertical um, lip here symmetrical handles and this little uh, stem base that gives the whole whole piece some kind of grace and elegance that otherwise wouldn't have without it. And here's a little slightly better picture. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is working in pieces, making two symmetrical handles, uh, myelka and cobalt wash. And so first things first, is how to make this or how I would make this is that I would really break it up into just a couple pieces and you know you'd be throwing I think a good amount of clay with this whole kind of body but instead of like trying to like carve this out from trimming or some other method you just throw this base part the stem a little separately or separately and attach it at a leather hard stage and the same thing with these symmetrical handles. So the kind of key part is uh, when to attach things. I would throw this part, uh, use a technique called collaring in. It's not a really crazy technique. It's just bringing your hands together, forcing the clay inwards, and since it has nowhere else to go, upwards. And it creates just generally with the form of your hands this sort of um, what we call a collar. And then to make this nice little vertical lip here, just this little accent, um, you can just take your wooden or metal rib to straighten everything out. F, as this was drying up, I would have a little bit of clay and make the stem the same technique of collaring, just throw a smaller cylinder uh, bringing your hands together, kind of a specific form works the best. You can look it up or ask um, a teacher and create this uh, form. The one thing that I, I'll mention that we can't really see, it probably does flare out a little before the two parts meet. Uh, and that's just for physics to support this weight of this piece a little better. And... During this time, too, I'd probably make this and make this part. And then I'd make these handles. It would be, it's not at all impossible, but it would require some practice to th uh, pull these handles, do the process that's like the most kind of organic pottery method, uh, pulling handles. It, but you could definitely do it. But you could also use the extruder that's available and there's one die in particular that I'm thinking of that has kind of two tapered edges that's really nice it fits your hand really well so you could use that too and it would give you a very consistent obviously um, whatever length you wanted but the key part is to make the form you want uh, you could draw it out or put them on top of each other um, on their side but you just want to leave them on a table or I think what would work probably better is on a wear board under plastic overnight in in that form to let them set up. And the key part is letting them set up so you can kind of uh, slip and score each of these sides pretty easily but without distorting the shape you want of the handles and the kind of elegance of the handles. Um, be, but before you did that, you'd want to trim this part out because you're going to have probably like where my cursor is this much of clay left over. You want to be sure not to be trimming too much right here. You don't want to get it too thin because 
no matter what, this is supporting a lot, especially during the two firings. So you don't want to overdo it and make this really heavy and crazy um, at the base, but you don't want to make it too thin either. The, the part that is key to remember is to when to attach all these pieces and weather hard is a is definitely gets you in there but it is better if it's at a drier stage of leather hard it's definitely not bone dry by any means but it's also not soft it's definitely far away from the plastic stage that it originally was at so just keep in mind, like it has to support the weight, so it has to be a drier leather hard, but still has to attach to each other, all the pieces. And you would, of course, slip and score these, or at least do the cross hatching, add some water, if not slip, so they stick together really well. And you get this piece out, out of the first firing. If there's no cracks, it's great. Um, the Myolica glaze is. It's kind of old. It only refers to this lead-based glaze that has tin oxide in it that makes it white. Uh, we don't really use tin oxide anymore, not for any other reason than economics as far or resources. And there's just cheaper alternatives out there that make the same glaze. But why this glaze was so great, a lot of a lot of places, especially around uh, Western Europe, had you can see this little base right here. It's kind of like a earthy. Um, tan color. Some some potteries were using had only red clay to deal with, but this white glaze covered everything, and gave it a lot more elegance and prominence, and just kind of flash and flare. And the other nice thing about this glaze is that you can see it's shiny, but it's not like super glossy. And so what that means is that it wouldn't, there wouldn't be any glaze drips if you did it right, or it wouldn't be any like weird um, just glaze uh, errors that happened a lot and so that led to all these designers doing these really kind of intricate decorations because they wouldn't drip or they wouldn't do anything and basically they would dip it after bisque and then do patterning like this or I'll show you in a minute something like that and it wouldn't move at all so they were able to get exactly what they did before firing out of firing, but it was fired on there, so it would be permanent, creating a lot of um, different variations. And Deruta Pottery went, just loved this form and did a, a whole variety of this form. For something like this, they would just use the same like Myolica base glaze and give it a couple different or one or two other different heavy metal colorants, like a, a little more lead or a little more cobalt or a little less cobalt, to get these colors. And it would be the same thing. The glaze wouldn't move at all, so they'd get this really nice um, clear decoration through it all. And for something like this, just change your brushes. I, I like the horsehair brush, the kind of like softer brushes that you find. They're very common. But just a nice thin brush to get these really thin lines and the slightly thicker ones just so you're not spending too much time creating too much unnecessary brush strokes. But you can see the brush strokes in here. Uh, really kind of nice, stunning. Very same, same form, uh, a lot of different motifs. The kind of interesting part about this, you can see in this piece, 16th century was when that was made. All these examples are within a hundred years of either direction of that. Um, I think this is like the most recent, this is more like late 17th century. And what was happening there is that Italy was going through a lot of hardship. There was a little bit of a plague, um, a couple wars, a couple different like um, economic movements. Uh, so a lot of the master craftsmen went away from it for whatever reason and so they're kind of left with this kind of a still elegant but you can see the handles are a little cruder some of the decoration is still it's a lot more ornate but a little like a little less uh focused on detail and you can see the subject matter is a little more body so it's kind of funny to notice that change anyway thanks for listening